The men are armed and for the fight prepare, and now we must instruct and arm the fair. Both sexes well appointed take the field, and mighty love determine which shall yield. Man were ignoble when thus armed to show unequal force against a naked foe. No glory from such conquest can be gained, and odds are always by the brave disdained. But some exclaim, what frenzy rules your mind? Would you increase the craft of womankind, teach them new wiles and arts? As well you may instruct a snake to bite, or wolf to prey. But sure, too hard a censure they pursue, who charge on all the failings of a few. Examine first impartially each fair, then as she merits, or condemn or spare. If Menelaus and the king of men with justice of their sister wives complain, if false Eryphile forsook her faith, and for reward procured her husband's death, Penelope was loyal still and chaste, though twenty years her lord in absence passed. Reflect how Laodamia's truth was tried, who, though in bloom of youth and beauty's pride, to share her husband's fate, untimely died. Think how Alcestis piety was proved, who lost her life to save the man she loved. Receive me, Capaeus, Evadne cried, nor death itself our nuptials shall divide. To join thy ashes, pleased I shall expire, she said, and leaped amidst the funeral fire. Virtue herself a goddess, we confess, a both female in her name and in her dress. No wonder, then, if to her sex inclined, she cultivates with care a female mind. But these exalted souls exceed the reach of that soft art which I pretend to teach. My tender bark requires a gentle gale. A little wind will fill a little sail. Of sportful loves I sing, and show what ways the willing nymph must use her bliss to raise, and how to captivate the man she'd please. Woman is soft and of a tender heart, apt to receive and to retain love's dart. Man has a breast robust and more secure. It wounds him not so deep, nor hits so sure. Men oft are false, and if you search with care, you'll find less fraud imputed to the fair. The faithless Jason from Medea fled, and made Creus a partner of his bed. Bright Ariadne, on an unknown shore, thy absence purged Theseus did deplore. If then the wild inhabitants of air forbore her tender, lovely limbs to tear, it was not owing Theseus to thy care. Inquire the cause, and let Demophoon tell why Phyllis by a fate untimely fell. Nine times in vain upon the promised day, she sought the appointed shore and viewed the sea. Her fall the fading trees consent to mourn, and shed their leaves round her lamented urn. The prince so far for piety renowned, to thee, Eliza, was unfaithful found, to thee forlorn and languishing with grief. His sword alone he left thy last relief. Ye ruined nymphs, shall I the cause impart of all your woes? T'was want of needful art. Love of itself too quickly will expire. But powerful art perpetuates desire. Women had yet their ignorance bewailed, had not this art by Venus been revealed. Before my sight the Cyprian goddess shone, and thus she said, What have poor woman done? Why is that weak, defenceless sex exposed, on every side by men well armed, enclosed? Twice are the men instructed by thy muse, nor must she now to teach the sex refuse. The bard who injured Helen in his song, recanted after and redressed the wrong. And you, if on my favour you depend, the cause of woman while you live, defend. This said, a myrtle sprig, which berries bore, she gave me, for a myrtle wreath she wore. The gift received, my sense enlightened grew, and from her presence inspiration drew. Attend ye nymphs by wedlock unconfined, and hear my precepts while she prompts my mind. E'en now, in bloom of youth and beauty's prime, beware of coming age, nor waste your time. Now, while you may and ripening years invite, enjoy the seasonable sweet delight. For rolling years, like stealing waters, glide, for hope to stop their ever-ebbing tide. Think not hereafter will the loss repay, for every morrow will the taste decay and leave less relish than the former day. I've seen the time when, on that withered thorn, the blooming rose vied with the blushing morn. With fragrant wreaths I thence have decked my head, and see how leafless now, and how decayed. And you who now the lovesick youth reject, will prove in age what pains attend neglect. None then will press upon your midnight hours, nor wake to strew your street with morning flowers. Then nightly knockings at your doors will cease, whose noiseless hammer then may rest in peace. Alas, how soon a clear complexion fades, how soon a wrinkled skin plump flesh invades. And what avails it, though the fair one swears she from her infancy had some grey hairs? She grows all hoary in a few more years, and then the venerable truth appears. 
The snake his skin, the deer his horns may cast, and both renew their youth and vigor past. But no receipt can humankind relieve, doomed to decrepit age without reprieve. Then crop the flower which yet invites your eye, and which, ungathered on its stalk, must die. Besides, the tender sex is formed to bear, and frequent birth too soon will youth impair. Continual harvest wears the fruitful field, and earth itself decays too often tilled. Thou didst not, Cynthia, scorn the Latmian swain, nor thou, Aurora, Cephalus, disdain, the Paphian queen, who for Adonis's fate so deeply mourned, and who laments him yet, has not been found inexorable since. Witness Harmonia and the Dardan prince, then take example, mortals, from above, and like immortals live, and like em love. Refuse not those delights which men require, nor let your lovers languish with desire. False those they prove, what loss can you sustain? Thence let a thousand take, twill all remain. Though constant use, e'en flint and steel impairs, what you employ no diminution fears, who would to light a torch their torch deny? Or who can dread drinking an ocean dry? Still women lose, you cry, if men obtain. What do they lose that's worthy to retain? Think not this said to prostrate the sex, but undeceive whom needless fears perplex. Thus far the gentle breeze supplies our sail. Now, launched to sea, we ask a brisker gale. And first we treat of dress. The well-dressed vine produces plumpest grapes and richest wine, and plenteous crops of golden grain are found alone to grace uncultivated ground. Beauty's the gift of gods, the sex is pride. Yet to how many is that gift denied? Art helps a face. A face, though heavenly fair, may quickly fade for want of needful care. In ancient days, if women slighted dress, then men were ruder too, and liked it less. If Hector's spouse was clad in stubborn stuff, a soldier's wife became it well enough. Ajax, to shield his ample breast, provides seven lusty bulls, and tans their sturdy hides. And might not he, do you think, be well caressed, and yet his wife not elegantly dressed? With rude simplicity, Rome first was built, which now we see adorned and gilt. This capital with that of old compare, some other Jove you'd think was worshipped there. That lofty pile where senates dictate law when Tatius reigned was poorly thatched with straw, and where Apollo's fane refulgent stands was heretofore a tract of pasture lands. Let ancient manners other men delight, but me the modern please as more polite. Not that materials now in gold are wrought, and distant shores for orient pearls are sought, not for that hills exhaust their marble veins, and structures rise whose bulks the sea retains, but that the world is civilized of late, and polished from the rust of former date. Let not the nymph with pendants load her ear, nor an embroidery or brocade appear. Too rich a dress may sometimes check desire, and cleanliness more animate loves fire. The hair disposed may gain or lose a grace, and much become or misbecome the face. What suits your features of your glass inquire? For no one rule is fixed for head attire, a face too long should part and flat the hair. Lest upward combed, the length too much appear. So Laodamia dressed. A face too round should show the ears and with a tour be crowned. On either shoulder one her locks displays, adorned like Phoebus when he sings his lays. Another all her tresses tie behind. So dressed, Diana hunts the fearful hind. Dishevelled locks most graceful are to some. Others the binding fillets more become. Some plait like spiral shells their braided hair. Others the loosened waving curl prefer. But to recount the several dresses worn which artfully each several face adorned were endless as to till the leaves on trees, the beasts on alpine hills or hibla bees. Many there are who seem to slight all care and, with a pleasing negligence in snare, whole mornings oft in such a dress are spent, and all is art that looks like accident. With such disorder I all was graced when great Alcides first the nymph embraced. So Ariadne came to Bacchus's bed, when with the conqueror from Crete she fled. Nature indulgent to the sex, repays the losses they sustain by various ways. Men ill supply those hairs they shed in age, lost like autumnal leaves when north winds rage. Women with juice of herbs grey locks disguise, and art gives colour which with nature vies. The well-wove tours they wear their own art thought, but only are their own as what they've bought. Nor need they blush to buy heads ready dressed, and choose at public shops what suits them best. Costly apparel let the fair one fly enriched with gold, or with the Tyrian dye what folly must in such expense appear, when more becoming colours are less dear. 
One with a dye is tinged of lovely blue, such as through air serene the sky we view. With yellow lustre see another spread, as if the golden fleece composed the thread. Some of the sea green wave the cast display. With this the nymphs their beauteous forms array, and some the saffron hue will well adorn. Such is the mantle of the blushing morn. Of myrtle berries one the tincture shows. In this of amethysts the purple glows, and that more imitates the paler rose. Nor Thracian cranes forget, whose silvery plumes give patterns which employ the mimic looms. Nor almond, nor the chestnut dye disclaim, nor others which from wax derive their name. As fields you find, with various flowers are spread, when vineyards bud and winter's frost is fled. So various are the colours you may try, of which the thirsty wool imbibes the dye. Try every one, what best becomes you wear, for no complexion all alike can bear. If fair the skin, black may become it best. In black the lovely fair Brisse is dressed. If brown the nymph, let her be clothed in white. Andromeda so charmed the wandering sight. I need not warn you of two powerful smells, which sometimes health or kindly heat expels, nor from your tender legs to pluck with care the casual growth of all unseemly hair. Though not to nymphs of Caucasus I sing, nor such who taste remote the mission spring, yet let me warn you that through no neglect, you let your teeth disclose the least defect. You know the use of white to make you fair, and how with red lost colour to repair. Imperfect eyebrows you by art can mend, and skin when wanting or a scar extend. Nor need the fair one be ashamed who tries by art to add new lustre to her eyes. A little book I've made but with great care how to preserve the face and how repair. In that, the nymphs, by time or chance annoyed, may see what pains to please them I've employed. But still beware that from your lover's eye you keep concealed the medicines you apply. Though art assists, yet must that art be hid, lest whom it would invite it should forbid. Who would not take offence to see a face all daubed and dripping with the melty grease? And though your unguents bear the Athenian name, the wool's unsavoury scent is still the same. Marrow of stags, nor your pomatums try, nor clean your furry teeth when men are by. For many things when done afford delight, which yet, while doing, may offend the sight. E'en Myro's statues, which for art surpass all others, once were but a shapeless mass. Rude was that gold which now in rings is worn, as once the robe you wear was wool unshorn. Think how that stone rough in the quarry grew, which now a perfect Venus shows to view. While we suppose you sleep, repair your face, locked from observers in some secret place. Add the last hand before yourselves you show your need of art, why should your lover know? For many things, when most concealed, are best, and few of strict inquiry bear the test. Those figures, which in theatres are seen, gilded without, are common wood within. But no spectators are allowed to pry till all is finished which allures the eye. Yet, I must own, it off affords delight to have the fair one comb her hair in sight. To view the flowing honours of her head fall on her neck and were her shoulders spread. But let her look that she with care avoid all fretful humours while she's so employed. Let her not still undo with peevish haste. All that her woman does who does her best. I hate a vixen that her maid assails, and scratches with her bodkin or her nails. While the poor girl in blood and tears must mourn, and her heart curses what her hands adorn, let her who has no hair, or has but some plant sentinels before her dressing room, or in the fane of the good goddess dress, where all the male kind are debarred access. Tis said that I, but tis a tale devised, a lady at her toilet once surprised, who starting snatched in haste the tour she wore, and in her hurry placed the hinder part before. But on our foes fall every such disgrace, or barbarous beauties of the Parthian race, Ungraceful tis to see without a horn the lofty heart whom branches best adorn a leafless tree or an unverdant mead, and as ungraceful is a hairless head. But think not these instructions are designed for first-rate beauties of the finished kind. Not to a semele or a Leda bright nor an Europa these my rules I write. Nor the fair Helen do I teach whose charms stirred up a trident and all Greece to arms. Thee to regain well was that war begun, and Paris well defended what he won. What lover or what husband would not fight in such a cause where both are in the right? The crowd I teach, some homely and some fair, but of the former sort the larger share. The handsome least require the help of art, rich in themselves and pleased with nature's part. When calm the sea at ease the pilot lies, but all his skill exerts when storms arise. 
Faults in your person or your face correct, and few are seen that have not some defect. The nymph too short her seat should seldom quit, lest when she stands she may be thought to sit, and when extended on her couch she lies, let length of petticoats conceal her size. The lean of thick wrought stuff her clothes should choose, and fuller made than what the plumper use. If pale, let her the crimson juice apply. If swarthy to the fairy and varnish fly. A leg too lank, tight garters still must wear, nor should an ill-shaped foot be ever bare. Round shoulders bolstered will appear the least, and lacing straight confines too full a breast, whose fingers are too fat and nails too coarse, should always shun much gesture in discourse. And you whose breath is touched, this caution take, nor fasting nor too near another speak. Let not the nymph with laughter much abound, whose teeth are black, uneven or unsound. You'd hardly think how much on this depends, and how a laugh or spoils a face or mends. Gape not too wide, lest you disclose your gums and lose the dimple which the cheek becomes. Nor let your sides too long concussions shake, lest you the softness of the sex forsake. In some distortions, quite the face disguise. Another laughs that you would think she cries. In one too hoarse a voice we hear betrayed. Another's is as harsh as if she brayed. What cannot art attain? Many with ease have learned to weep, both when and how they please. Others through affectation lisp and find in imperfection charms to catch mankind. Neglect no means which may promote your end. Now learn what way of walking recommends. Too masculine emotion shocks the sight, but female grace allures with strange delight. One has an artful swing and jut behind, which helps her coats to catch the swelling wind. Swelled with the wanton wind, they loosely flow, and every step and graceful motion show. Another, like an Umbrian sturdy spouse, strides all the space her petticoats allows. Between extremes, in this a mean adjust, nor show too nice a gait, nor too robust. If snowy white your neck, you still should wear that and the shoulder of the left arm bare. Such sights ne'er fail to fire my amorous heart and make me pant to kiss the naked part. Sirens, though monsters of the stormy main, can ships when under sail with songs detain. Scarce could Ulysses by his friends be bound when first he listens to the charming sound. Singing insinuates, learn all ye maids. Oft when a face forbids, a voice persuades. Whether on theatres loud strains we hear, or in ruelles some soft Egyptian air, well shall she sing of whom I make my choice, and with her lute accompany her voice. The rocks were stirred, the beasts to listen stayed, when on his lyre melodious Orpheus played, even Cerberus and Hell that sound obeyed, and stones officious were thy walls to raise. Zero Thebes attracted by Amphion's lays. The dolphin, dumb itself, thy voice admired, and was, Arian, by thy songs inspired. Of sweet Callimachus the works rehearse, and real Philetus and Anacreon's verse, Tarentian plays may much the mind improve, but softest Sappho best instructs to love. Propertius, Gallus, and Tibullus read, and let Veronian verse to these succeed. Then mighty Maro's work with care peruse. Of all the Latians boards the noblest muse, even I, tis possible in after days, may scape oblivion and be named with these. My laboured lines some readers may approve, since I've instructed either sex in love. Whatever book you read of this soft art, read with a lover's voice and lover's heart. Tender epistles too by me are framed, a work before unthought of and unnamed. Such was your sacred will, zero tuneful nine, such thine Apollo and Lycreus thine. Still unaccomplished may the maid be thought, who gracefully to dance was never taught, that active dancing may to love engage, witness the well-kept dancers of the stage. Of some odd trifles I'm ashamed to tell, though it becomes the sex to trifle well. To raffle prettily or slur a die implies both cunning and dexterity, nor is to miss at chess to be expert, for games most thoughtful, sometimes most divert. Learn every game, you'll find it prove of use. Parties begun at play may love produce, but easier tis to learn how bets to lay than how to keep your temper while you play. Unguarded then each breast is open laid, and while the head's intent the heart's betrayed. Then base desire of gain, then rage appears, quarrels and brawls arise, and anxious fears. Then clamours and revilings reach the sky, while losing gamsters all the gods defy. They grieve and curse and storm, they weep at last. Good Jove avert such shameful faults as these from every nymph whose heart's inclined to please soft recreations fit the female kind. Nature for men has rougher sports designed, 
to wield the sword and hurl the pointed spear, to stop or turn the steed in full career. Though martial fields ill suit your tender frames, nor may you swim in Tiber's rapid streams, yet when Saul's burning wheels from Leo drive and at the glowing virgin sign arrive, tis both allowed and fit you should repair to pleasant walks and breathe refreshing air, to Pompey's gardens or the shady groves which Caesar honours and which Phoebus loves. Phoebus, who sunk the proud Egyptian fleet and made Augustus's victory complete. Or seek those shades where monuments of fame are raised to Livia's or Octavia's name, or where Agrippa first adorned the ground when he with naval victory was crowned. To Isis's fine, to theatre's resort, and in the circus see the noble sport. In every public place by turns be shown, in vain you're fair while you remain unknown. Should you in singing Thamiris transcend your voice unheard, who will your skill commend? Had not Apelles drawn the sea-born queen, her beauty still beneath the waves had been. Poets inspired write only for a name, and think their labours well repaid with fame. In former days, I own, the poets were of gods and king the most peculiar care. Majestic awe was in the name allowed, and they with rich possessions were endowed. Aeneas with honours was by Scipio graced and next his own the poet's statue placed. But now their ivy crowns bear no esteem, and all their learnings thought an idle dream. Still there's a pleasure that proceeds from praise. What could the high renown of Homer raise, but that he sung his Iliad's deathless lays? Who could have been of Danae's charms assured, had she grown old within her tower immured? This is a rule let every nymph pursue, that tis her interest oft to come in view. A hungry wolf at all the herd will run in hopes through many to make sure of one. So let the fair the gazing crowd assail, that over one at least she may prevail, in every place to please be all her thought, where sometimes least we think the fish is caught. Sometimes all day we hunt the tedious foil anon, the stag himself shall seek the toil. How could Andromeda once doubt relief, whose charms were heightened and adorned by grief? The widowed fair who sees her lord expire while yet she weeps may kindle new desire, and Hymen's torch relight the funeral fire. Beware of men who are too sprucely dressed. And look, you fly with speed of fop professed. Such tools to you and to a thousand more will tell the same dull story o'er and o'er. This way add that unsteadily they rove and never fixed are fugitives in love. Such fluttering things all women sure should hate, light as themselves and more effeminate. Believe me, all I say is for your good. Had Priam been believed, Troy still had stood. Many with base designs will passions feign, who know no love but sordid love of gain. But let not powdered heads nor essenced hair your well-believing easy hearts ensnare. Rich clothes are oft by common sharpers worn, and diamond rings felonious hands adorn. So may your lover burn with fierce desire your jewels to enjoy and best attire. Poor Chloe robbed, runs crying through the streets, and as she runs, give me my own repeats. How often, Venus, hast thou heard such cries and laughed amidst thy Appian votaries? Some so notorious are their very name, must every nymph whom they frequent defame. Be warned by ills which others have destroyed, and faithless men with constant care avoid. Trust not a Theseus, fair Athenian maid, who has so oft the attesting gods betrayed. And thou, Demophon, heir to Theseus's crimes, hast lost thy credit to all future times. Promise for promise, equally afford, but once a contract made, keep a well your word. For she for any act of hell is fit, and undismayed may sacrilege commit. With impious hands could quench the vestal fire, poison her husband in her arms for hire. Who first to take a lover's gift complies, and then defrauds him, and his claim denies, but hold, my muse, check thy unruly horse, and more in sight pursue the intended course. If love epistles tender lines impart, and billet do are sent to sound your heart, let all such letters by a faithful maid or confident be secretly conveyed. Soon from the words you'll judge, if read with care, when feigned a passion is, and when sincere. In return you write some time require. Delays, if not too long, increase desire, nor let the pressing youth with ease obtain, nor yet refuse him with too rude disdain. Now let his hopes, now let his fears increase, but by degrees let fear to hope give place. Be sure avoid set phrases when you write. The usual way of speech is more polite. How have I seen the puzzled lover vexed, to read a letter with hard words perplexed? A style too coarse takes from a handsome face, and makes us wish an uglier in its place.
but since, though chastity be not your care. You, from your husband, still would hide the affair, write to no stranger till his truth be tried, nor in a foolish messenger confide. What agonies that woman undergoes, whose hand the traitor threatens to expose, who rashly trusting, dreads to be deceived, and lives forever to that dread enslaved. Such treachery can never be surpassed, for those discoveries, sure as lightning, blast. Might I advise, fraud should with fraud be paid. Let arms repel all who with arms invade. But since your letters may be brought to light, what if in several hands you learn to write? My curse on him who first the sex betrayed, and this advice so necessary made. Nor let your pocketbook two hands contain. First rub your lovers out, then write again. Still one contrivance more remains behind, which you may use as a convenient blind. As if to women writ your letters frame, and let your friend, to you, subscribe a female name. Now greater things to tell, my muse prepare and clap on all the sail the bark can bear. Let no rude passions in your looks find place, for fury will deform the finest face. It swells the lips and blackens all the veins, while in the eye a gorgon horror reigns. While on her flute divine Minerva played, and in a fountain saw the change it made, swelling her cheek, she flung it quick aside. Nor is thy music so much worth, she cried. Look in your glass when you with anger glow, and you'll confess you scarce yourself can know. Nor with excessive pride insult the sight, for gentle looks alone to love invite. Believe it as a truth that's daily tried, there's nothing more detestable than pride. How have I seen some airs disgust create, like things which by antipathy we hate? Let looks with looks, and smiles with smiles be paid, and when your lover bows, incline your head. So love preluding plays at first with hearts, and after wounds with deeper piercing darts, nor me a melancholy mistress charms. Let sad Tecmessa weep in Ajax's arms. Let mournful beauty's sullen heroes move, we cheerful men like gaiety and love. Let Hector in Andromache delight, who in bewailing Troy wastes all the night. Had they not both borne children to be plain, and e'er could think they'd with their husbands lain, I no idea in my mind can frame that either one or t'other doleful dame could toy, could fondle, or could call their lords my life, my soul, or speak endearing words. Why, from comparisons should I refrain or fear small things by greater to explain? Observe what conduct prudent generals use, and how their several officers they choose, to one a charge of infantry commit, another for the horses thought more fit. So you your several lovers should select, and as you find them qualified, direct, the wealthy lover store of gold should send, the lawyer should in courts your case defend. We who write verse with verse alone should bribe, most apt to love is all the tuneful tribe. By us your fame shall throw the world be blazed, so Nemesis, so Cynthia's name was raised. From east to west Lycoris's praises ring, nor are Corinna's silent whom we sing. No fraud the poet's sacred breast can bear, milder his manners and his heart sincere, nor wealth he seeks, nor feels ambition's fires, but shuns the bar. And books and shades requires, too faithfully, alas, we know to love, with ease we fix, but we with pain remove, our softer studies with our souls combine, and both to tenderness our hearts incline. Be gentle, virgins, to the poet's prayer, the god that fills him, and the muse revere. Something divine is in us, and from heaven the inspiring spirit can alone be given. Tis sin a price from poets to exact, but tis a sin no woman fears to act. Yet hide, howe'er, your avarice from sight, lest you too soon your new admirer fright. As skilful riders reign with different force, a new-backed courser and a well-trained horse, do you by different management engage the man in years and youth of greener age. This while the wiles of love are yet unknown, will gladly cleave to you and you alone. With kind caresses oft indulge the boy, and all the harvest of his heart enjoy. Alone, thus blessed of rivals most beware, nor love nor empire can a partner bear. Men more discreetly love when more mature, and many things which youth disdains endure. No windows break, nor houses set on fire, nor tear their own or mistress's attire. In youth, the boiling blood gives fury vent, but men in years more calmly wrong resent, as wood when green, or as a torch when wet, they slowly burn, but long retain their heat. More bright is youthful flame, but sooner dies, then swiftly sees the joy that swiftly flies, thus all betraying to the beauteous foe. How surely to enslave ourselves we show, to trust a traitor you'll no scruple make, who is a traitor only for your sake, who yields too soon, will soon her lover lose. 
Would you retain him long, then long refuse? Oft at your door, make him for entrance wait. There, let him lie and threaten and entreat. Uh, when cloyed with sweets, bitters, o'er the taste restore, ships by fair winds are sometimes run ashore. Hence springs the coldness in a married life. The husband, when he pleases, has his wife. Barb at your gate, and let your porter cry. He is no admittance, sir, I must deny. The very husband, so repulsed, will find a growing inclination to be kind. Thus far with foils you've sought those laid aside. I now sharp weapons for the sex provide, nor doubt not against myself to see him tried. When first a lover you design to charm, beware lest jealousy's his sole alarm. Make him believe with all the skill you can that he and only he's the happy man. Anon, by due degrees, small doubts create, and let him fear some rival's better fate. Such little arts make love its vigour hold, which else would languish and too soon grow old. Then strains the courser to outstrip the wind, when one before him runs and one he hears behind. Love, when extinct, suspicions may revive. I own when mine's secure, tis scarce alive. Yet no precaution to this rule belongs here. Let us at most suspect not prove our wrongs. Sometimes your lover, to incite the more, pretends your husband's spies beset the door. Spy Though free as Tay, still affect a fright, for seeming danger heightens the delight. Oft let the youth in through your window steal, though he might enter at the door as well. And sometimes let your maid surprise pretend, and beg you in some hole to hide your friend. Yet ever and anon dispel his fear, and let him taste of happiness sincere. Lest, quite disheartened with too much fatigue, he should grow weary of the dull intrigue. But I forgot to tell how you may try both to evade the husband and the spy. That wives should of their husband stand in awe agrees with justice, modesty, and law. But that a mistress may be lawful prize, none but her keeper, I am sure, denies. For such fair nymphs these precepts are designed, which ne'er can fail, joined with a willing mind. And though stuck with Argus's eyes your keeper were, advised by me you shall elude his care. When you to wash or bathe retire from ache, can he observe what letters then you write? Or can his caution against such provide, which in her breast your confidant may hide? Can he that note beneath her garter view, or that which more concealed is in her shoe? Yet these perceived you may her back undress, and writing on her skin your mind express. New milk or pointed spires of flax when green will ink supply and letters mark unseen. Farewell the paper, show nor can be read, till all the writings with warm ashes spread. Acritius was with all his care betrayed, and in his tower of brass a grandsire made. Can spies avail when you to plays resort, or in the circus view the noble sport, or can you be to Isis fain pursued, or Cybele's, whose rights all men exclude? Though watchful servants to the banyo come, they're ne'er admitted to the bathing room. Or when some sudden sickness you pretend, may you not take to your sick bed a friend? False keys a private passage may procure. If not, there are more ways besides the door. Sometimes with wine your watchful follower treat. When drunk you may with ease his care defeat. Or to prevent too sudden a surprise, prepare a sleeping draught to seal his eyes. Or let your maid still longer time to gain an inclination for his person fain. With faint resistance let her drill him on, and after competent delays be won. But what need all these various doubtful wiles, since gold, the greatest vigilance beguiles? Believe me, men and gods with gifts are pleased, e'en angry Jove with offerings is appeased, with presents fools and wise alike are caught. Give but enough, the husband may be bought, but let we warn you when you bribe a spy, that you forever his connivance buy, pay him his price at once. For with such men you'll know no end of giving now and then. Once I remember I with cause complained of jealousy occasioned by a friend. Believe me, apprehensions of that kind are not alone to our false sex confined. Trust not too far your she-companion's truth, lest she sometimes should intercept the youth. The very confidant that lends the bed may entertain your lover in your stead, nor keep a servant with too fair a face, for such I've known supply her lady's place. But whither do I run with heedless rage, teaching the foe unequal war to wage? Did ever bird the fowler's net prepare? Was ever hound instructed by the hare? But all self-ends and interests set apart, I'll faithfully proceed to teach my art. Defenceless and unarmed expose my life, and for the Lemnian ladies wet the knife. Perpetual fondness of your lover fain, nor will you find it hard belief to gain. Full of himself he your design will aid. To what we wish tis easy to persuade. With dying eyes his face and form survey, then sigh and wonder he so long could stay. 
Now drop a tear your sorrows to assuage anon, reproach him and pretend to rage. Such proofs as these will all distrust remove, and make him pity your excessive love. Scarce to himself will he forbear to cry, How can I let this poor fond creature die? But chiefly one such fond behaviour fires, who courts his glass and his own charms admires. Proud of the homage to his merit done, he'll think a goddess might with ease be won. Light wrongs be sure you still with mildness bear, nor straight fly out when you arrival fear. Let not your passions o'er your sense prevail, nor credit lightly every idle tale. Let Procris's fate a sad example be of what effects attend credulity. Near where his purple head Hymettus shows, and flowering hills a sacred fountain flows, with soft and verdant turf the soil is spread, and sweetly smelling shrubs the ground o'er shade. There rosemary and bays their odours join, and with the fragrant myrtle's scent combine, their tamarisks with thick-leaved box are found, and citruses and garden pines abound. While through the boughs soft winds of zephyr pass, tremble the leaves and tender tops of grass, Hither would Cephalus retreat to rest, when tired with hunting or with heat oppressed. And thus, to air the panting youth would pray, Come, gentle Aura, come this heat allay. But some tale-bearing, too officious friend, by chance o'erheard him as he thus complained, who with the news to Procris quick repaired, repeating word for word what she had heard. Soon as the news of Aura reached her ears, with jealousy surprised, and fainting fears her rosy colour fled her lovely face, and agonies like death supplied the place. Pale she appeared as are the falling leaves when first the vine the winter's blast receives. Of ripened quinces such the yellow hue, or when unripe we cornel berries view. Reviving from her swoon, her robes she tore, nor her own faultless face to wound forbore. Now all dishevelled to the woods she flies, with bacchanalian fury in her eyes, Thither arrived she leaves below her friends, and all alone the shady hill ascends. What fully, Procris, or thy mind prevailed? What rage thus fatally to lie concealed? Who are this aura be, such was thy thought? She now shall in the very fact be caught, and on thy heart repents its rash designs, and now to go, and now to stay, inclines. Thus, love, with doubts perplexes still thy mind, and makes thee seek what thou must dread to find. But still the rival's name rings in thy ears, and more suspicious still the place appears, but more than all excessive love deceives, which all it fears too easily believes. And now a chillness runs through every vein, soon as she saw where Cephalus had lain. T'was noon when he again retired, to shun the scorching ardour of the midday sun. With water first he sprinkled o'er his face, which glowed with heat, then sought his usual place. Procris, with anxious but with silent care, viewed him extended with his bosom bare, and heard him soon the accustomed words repeat. Come, Zephyr, Aura, come, allay this heat. Soon as she found her error from the word, her colour and her temper were restored. With joy she rose to clasp him in her arms, but Cephalus the rustling noise alarms. Some beast he thinks he in the bushes hears, and straight his arrows and his bow prepares. Hold, hold, unhappy youth, I call in vain. With thy own hand thou hast thy Procris slain, me, me, she cries, thou'st wounded with thy dart. But Cephalus was wont to wound this heart. Yet lighter on my ashes earth will lie, since though untimely I unrivaled die. Come close with thy dear hand, my eyes in death, jealous of air, to air I yield my breath. Close to his heavy heart, her cheek he laid, and washed with streaming tears the wound he made. At length the springs of life their currents leave, and her last gasp her husband's lips receive. Now to pursue our voyage we must provide, till safe to port our weary bark we guide. You may expect, perhaps, I now should teach what rules to treats and entertainments reach. Come not the first, invited to a feast, rather come last as a more grateful guest, for... And that of which we fear to be deprived meets with the surest welcome when arrived. Besides complexions of a coarser kind, from candlelight no small advantage find. During the time you eat, observe some grace, nor let your unwiped hands besmear your face, nor yet too squeamishly your meat avoid, lest we suspect you were in private cloyed. Of all extremes in either kind forbear, and still, before your belly's full beware. No glutton nymph, however fair, can wound, though more than Helen she in charms abound. I own I think of wire, the moderate use more suits the sex, and sooner finds excuse. It warms the blood, adds luster to the eyes, and wine and love have always been allies. 
but carefully from all intemperance keep, nor drink till you see double, lisp, or sleep. For in such sleeps brutalities are done, which though you loathe, you have no power to shun. No p and now the instructed nymph from table led, should next be taught how to behave in bed, but modesty forbids. Nor more my muse with weary wings the laboured flight pursues. Her purple swans unyoked the chariot leave, and needful rest their journey done receive. Thus with impartial care my art I show, and equal arms on either sex bestow. White men and maids who by my rules improve, Ovid must own their master is in love.